Good evening and welcome. And thank you for joining us again for the last talk in our series, Slavery and Freedom and the Making of America. I would first like to thank a number of people without whom this series would not have been possible. First, we are indebted and grateful to the fantastic staff members of the Department of History who've worked tonight and for months to coordinate this series. So we thank Matt Erickson, Brendan Lee, Wanjiko Kitahi, Jerry Park, Lori Anthony, Kim McCraig, and Sarah Early. Divisional Dean Judy Howard first conceived of the idea for this series, and our chair, Lynn Thomas, followed through and executed the idea with so efficiently and graciously. So we thank you, Judy and Lynn. We are grateful to UWTV for partnering with us to record and broadcast this series. And we thank the Logan Family Endowment, which was established by Don Logan, who was an alumnus of the department and an avid student and scholar of the Civil War. We thank the family very much for their um, financial support that helped us to put this series together and also to broadcast it on UWTV. And I'd like to acknowledge, I can't see him, but Greg Logan has, uh, was able to join us tonight. And so thank you, Greg, and welcome. The Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies here at the University of Washington, as well as Vice Provost for Minority Affairs and Vice Provost for Diversity, Sheila Edwards Lang, and Associate Vice Provost for Faculty Advancement, Luis Fraga, also generously provided funding. So we thank them for their support of this series. Please join me in thanking all of our donors and supporters. Before introducing Professor Moon Ho Jung, I would like to say a few words about next year's lecture series. As you may know, 2014 is the 100th anniversary of World War I. To commemorate that momentous event in world history, next autumn, the Department of History, in partnership with the University of Washington Alumni Association, will host a history lecture series on the Great War and the making of the modern world. Four of the Department of History's um, outstanding faculty members will explore this important and fascinating history. The faculty members are Jordana Balkin, who is a modern, uh, excuse me, a historian of modern Britain and comparative colonialisms. Ray Jonas, a scholar of modern Europe and modern Africa. Devin Nahr, a scholar of modern Jewish history with a special emphasis on the Ottoman Empire and Greece and John Taves, a scholar of Europe's intellectual and cultural history. All of these historians are outstanding scholars and teachers, and we very much hope that you will be able to attend the le their lectures next fall. The series is entitled 1914, Great War and the Modern World. It will begin on Wednesday, November 5th, and will continue um, every following Wednesday for a month, so November 12th, the 19th, and then December 3rd. So with news of next year's series fresh on your minds, let's now turn to this year's topic, slavery and freedom in the making of America. Some of you might be interested in further reading on the themes and issues that we've explored in this series in the, over the past month. So we've created an online bookshelf. Um, our bibliography of recommended readings is available at historylectures.org. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge Brendan Lee and Eleanor Mahoney for creating such a beautiful webpage for this bibliography. Um, and also, I'd like to note that we are talking about adding some, um, adding some film, filmography and also some websites to that um, resource. Now, to introduce our speaker for tonight, we're in for a real treat. Professor Moon Ho Jung is the Walker Family Endowed Professor of History here at the University of Washington, where he teaches classes on Asian American history, American labor history, civil liberties, and 19th and 20th century US history. He's a hugely popular teacher and an award-winning author whose scholarship has stretched the study of slavery and emancipation, Asian American history and African American history into new connections and new forms. His 2006 book, Coolies and Cane, Race, Labor, and Sugar in the Age of Emancipation, challenges the categorization of Chinese laborers in the 19th century, which has historically, they have historically sort of fallen into two categories. Prior to the publication of Coolies and Cain, Chinese migrants uh, tended to 
fall either into the category of coolie laborer, which was understood to be um, the forced laborers, forced migrants who went to the Caribbean um, and where they served as a form of bound labor. Or on the other hand, uh, migrants were seen by historians as immigrants, which is to say that they were understood as free people who came to the US voluntarily and engaged in free labor. In fact, Professor Jung argued, though no one was really a coolie, which is a racialized and racist category, Asian migrants to the US in the last decades of the 19th century were widely regarded as coolies, not simply as um, immigrants, which meant that they were understood as bound laborers, as racialized outsiders, as permanent foreigners. In other words, they were a kind of slave. As Jung wrote, wrote in the wake of US emancipation, coolies were neither slave nor free, yet at the same time, they were actually both, slave and free. White supremacist efforts to account for the presence of Chinese migrants or coolies forced American culture to nudge the idea of race beyond the black-white paradigm, to add complexity to the slave-free binary, and to rethink the content of American national identity. He did all of this in beautiful, compelling prose. It's no wonder that Coolies and Kane won the prestigious Merle Curti Award from the Organization of American Historians, as well as the History Book Award from the Association for Asian American Studies. These days, he's working on a new book called The Unruly Pacific, Race and the Politics of Empire and Revolution, 1898 to 1941, which will be published by the University of California Press. Please help me in welcoming to the stage Moon Ho Jun. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, it's my honor to be a part of this lecture series. And I thank my colleagues, uh, Sandra Joshua, Stephanie Smowit, and Stephanie Camp for their wonderful lectures. Along with you, I have been learning so much over the last month. And they kept you engaged and excited enough so that you're here this evening. Um, as far as I'm concerned, that was their most important job, right? <laughs> to make sure I have an audience this evening. Uh, thank you for being here, and for those of you joining us on UW TV, uh, thank you for tuning in. In March 2008, then-presidential candidate Barack Obama was facing a barrage of uh, attacks for its association with Reverend Jeremiah Wright. In response, Obama decided to deliver a major speech on race, a speech that was widely praised for its frankness and boldness. And in the heady days of March 2008, that seems so long ago, Obama appeared to represent a new kind of politician, a mainstream politician capable of speaking about race, honestly and critically. For many Asian Americans in particular, we were intrigued and enthralled for Obama knew Asia and Asian Americans like no other major presidential candidate. Not only did he grow up in Asia and Hawaii, he has an Asian American sister, brother-in-law, and nieces. If Bill Clinton was the first black president, <laughs> then Barack Obama is definitely the first Asian American president. <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, but I digress. Now, Obama appeared to sound and look very different. There's no question about that. But less than a minute into that speech in March of 2008, it became very clear that there would be nothing revolutionary uttered that day. After an introductory nod to America's founding fathers, Obama turned to, in his words, this nation's original sin of slavery. 
Of course, he added quickly. The answer to the slavery question was already embedded within our Constitution, a Constitution that had at its very core the ideal of equal citizenship under the law, a Constitution that promised its people liberty and justice and a union that could be and should be perfected over time. The person delivering the message might have looked different, but his underlying message was not fundamentally different. In racial matters, the United States was fundamentally, supposedly, about racial exclusion in the past and national inclusion into the future, a promise supposedly inscribed in the Constitution. A Constitution, I should note, that in many ways strengthened the institution of slavery through a fugitive slave trait clause and uh, uh, the fugitive slave clause and the infamous three-fifths clause. Condemning his former pastor's sermons, Obama called for a new beginning, a historical vision not bound to what he called a tragic past, but striving for a more perfect union, the title of his speech. Although Obama's speech was, in truth, much more intelligent and insightful than perhaps any given by a major presidential candidate or a president, um, his framing of slavery as a sin as an aberration within an otherwise great nation did little to reckon with the deep and lasting legacies of slavery and race in American history. I begin with Obama's speech of 2008, not to attack Obama or his speech, but only to point out that his speech as critical as it was, represented a predominant telling of American history that can sanitize and disfigure that history beyond critical recognition. His speech did not represent an insurgent truth that might lead us to a deeper reckoning with slavery and freedom in the making of America. Perhaps we should not and cannot expect more from anyone with presidential aspirations. Lucky for you tonight, I have no such aspirations. <laughs> In my lecture tonight, I'd like to focus on three overlapping points. Number one, emancipation was a transformative moment in American history with roots and repercussions deep and wide. Number two, we cannot begin to grasp the great intellectual and political stakes of emancipation and what's come to be known as Reconstruction unless we expand our interpretive framework beyond the American South and indeed beyond the United States of America. And three, very much related to point number two, we cannot restrict definitions of freedom, or more precisely, our strivings for freedom, or visions of freedom, to the United States or to the Constitution, as Obama suggested. Freedom should be and must be something much bigger than a legal status or, a, or particular rights conferred or denied by the state or the government. Staking freedom to the U.S. state has historically enabled and sustained the U.S. empire. Instead, we should, and in fact we must, conceive and pursue freedom expansively and critically, both in our interpretations of the past 
and of the present. There is no question that emancipation declared through the Emancipation Proclamation for the Confederate States of America and enacted through the 13th Amendment across the United States dramatically reshaped the course of history. It was a transformative moment, a revolutionary moment of new possibilities. Once the Civil War began, the enslaved peoples across the South rose up fomenting a crisis that would lead to the abolition of slavery. On many levels, it was not, an, not a completely unexpected turn of events. A planner recounted in the early days of the Civil War, quote, as far as the memory, can go, uh, memory of man can go, there has existed among the Negro population a tradition which has caused us many a sleepless night, unquote. And the Civil War caused slaveholders more sleepless nights than ever before. Slaveholders could do little to stem the tide of slave runaways or slaves' claims to freedom. Their actions within and beyond the Union military ultimately decided the fate of the Civil War. Josephine Pugh, a plantation mistress, became distressed uh, over the state of her enslaved workers during the early part of the war. She observed, quote, they saw their masters leaving their homes. Their faith could not stand the test and numbers flocked to the Yankee standard, forming a motley, grotesque, and increasing multitude, unquote. Few hoped that her personal resolve would keep her workers on her estate. And, and when Union forces passed through her plantation, she was left helpless as they took all of the plantation livestock and, as she said, all the Negro men that they could lay their hands on. When enslaved workers who remained behind refused to work, Pew tried to appeal to them face to face, but she found no sympathy whatsoever. She wrote, quote, I was among a strange people and was unprepared for a change so great. I looked vainly in familiar faces for the old expression, unquote. When her voice shook and her eyes filled with tears, Pugh said that she saw only pleasure and triumph in the faces of her workers. And all but one invalid family left Pew's plantation within 24 hours. To slaveholders and slaves alike, the Civil War marked a revolutionary moment of new possibilities that caused great despair and equally great but a revolution was the last thing that most Union generals and Republican leaders wanted or pursued in 1861. Uh, the Republican Party became the majority, majority party in the North not because of its revolutionary agenda. In the 1850s and into the Civil War, most Republicans had no interest whatsoever in emancipation. For most Republicans, it was very possible, and more likely than not, to be both anti-slavery, not abolitionist, anti-slavery, and anti-black. Most were anti-slavery because of the way they came to understand freedom. Freedom for Republicans, as Eric Boner and others have argued, was rooted in the idea of free labor which did not mean wage labor, that is the right to work for somebody else. Free labor for Republicans of the mid 19th century meant the right not to work for someone else, the right to become an independent self producer, to become economically independent. It was the right to work to fulfill one's individual potential 
that largely defined American freedom in the middle of the 19th century. If you work hard enough, then you could supposedly succeed and become independent. It's the basis of the idea of what we now call the American dream. In, con in contrast, the majority of Republicans came to the South to see the South and slavery as the greatest threats to their free labor society. Slavery in the South seemed to represent a threat to everything that the North stood for. And, and in such ways, slavery in the South helped to define freedom and the North. So the South came to represent slavery, aristocracy, and the past that in turn made the North appear to epitomize free labor, democracy, and progress, at least for white folks. Republicans saw the South as the antithesis of the North. Common whites had no hope of working toward economic independence because of slavery and slave owners' monopoly over land, labor, and politics. An empire was central to the Republican vision of freedom. A free labor society required, they believed, ready access to new free soil. As free white men, they believed they ought to have the opportunity to become independent landowners, an opportunity seemingly most available out west. And, and that's why the Dred Scott decision of 1857 aroused such strong emotions in the North as well as in the South. The Supreme Court ruled that African Americans, whether free or enslaved, were not U.S. citizens, and, and that any federal measure restricting slavery to particular sections of the United States was unconstitutional. The Dred Scott decision seemed to sanction slavery anywhere and everywhere in the United States in all of its territories. And the Republican Party became increasingly popular in the North after the Dred Scott decision. Republicans demanded free soil, territorial expansion without slavery for themselves for free white men, not for enslaved African Americans. And, and that was the attitude that most Union generals and Republican officials held when the Civil War began. They believed that the South, both slaveholders and especially slaves, lived in a society contrary to their own. They believed that the South needed to be taught the social values of a free labor society. That is hard work, frugality, and individual enterprise. And with some exceptions, union officials were determined to compel enslaved African Americans to work to wage war against what they repeatedly called idleness, vagrancy, and crime. As union leaders preached over and over, freedom meant the right to work for yourself, not the freedom from work. This was one of the many ironies and contradictions of American freedom. That is, northern whites came down to the south to tell people who had worked all their lives that, that they needed to learn to work for their freedom. By compelling former slaves to return to plantation, plantation work and to sign long-term contracts, union officials thought they could reconcile 
the fundamental contradiction between slaveholders' claims to slave property and the slaves' claims to their own freedom, to their labor. But they couldn't. They could not reconcile that contradiction, and enslaved peoples were insistent and vigilant throughout the Civil War, uh, running away by the thousands and demanding land and rights even if they did not run away. And they also became a crucial source of labor within and for the Union military. Ultimately, 180,000 African Americans would join the Union forces during the Civil War. In claiming their freedom, their bodies, their labor, enslaved Africans infected, effected the most radical redistribution of property in U.S. history. To give you an example, the sugar plantations of Louisiana were valued at $200 million on the eve of the Civil War. More than half of that amount represented by the market value of their enslaved labor force. Through the destruction and depreciation of real property, and especially the abolition of slavery, the industry lost more than $193 million of its antebellum assessment. 193 out of $200 million vanished overnight. And no one recognized the great stakes of emancipation more than former slave owners. Within weeks of the conclusion of the Civil War, a U.S. commission inquired into the state of affairs in the South. William Minor, the owner of three large plantations, testified very frankly at a hearing held by that commission. He said, quote, the only certain remedy, remedy that we know of is to take us back under the Constitution and establish things as they were, but perhaps under some other name. Asked if he meant the reestablishment of slavery, Minor did not skip a beat. He said, yes, sir, I think this state and all the states would come back under the Constitution, sir. The Constitution and slavery, Minor insisted, could definitely coexist, perhaps forever, in this particular planner's vision of freedom. And, and Minor and his compatriots sought to do just that. That is to reestablish slavery, except perhaps in name. In the months after the Civil War and the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln, former slaveholders took steps to revive slavery as much as possible. With Andrew Johnson sitting in the White House, Johnson was not especially photogenic. He's actually smiling in that picture. Um, <laughs> Uh, can you imagine what he looked like when he was upset? Um, uh, with President Andrew Johnson issuing pardons left and right and restoring confis confiscated plantations to former owners, those who had been in power before the Civil War quickly regained their former political positions. And local and state governments across the South began passing laws, cumulatively known as the Black Codes, uh, that restricted the movements and rights of former slaves. Those who did not sign long-term labor contracts, for example, could be arrested for vagrancy and, and forced to work on public projects without pay. Some municipal governments updated the old slave codes by simply replacing the word slave with black. And 
there was a series of race riots in 1866 across the South where white mobs attacked African Americans. Among the bloodiest took place in New Orleans. And these developments shifted the political dynamic in the United States. In the wake of the black codes and mob violence, Republicans swept into office in the fall of 1866 with a two-thirds majority in Congress enough to override Johnson's veto. Fearing what they saw happening in the South, a reversion to a slave society, the radical wing of the Republican Party formed a coalition with moderate Republicans to reconstruct the South for good. In March of 1867, Republicans reconstructed Reconstruction, what historians call radical or congressional reconstruction to mandate racial equality in ways that even northern states at the time did not allow. Congress dissolved the state governments that had passed the black coats and issued steps for readmission into the Union. To be readmitted, uh, former Confederate states had to ratify a new state constitution that included black suffrage a right that did not exist at the time in many states in the North. And not only that, southern states had to ratify the 14th Amendment. In combination with the 13th Amendment, the ratification of the 14th Amendment in 1868 and the 15th Amendment in 1870 seemed to enshrine citizenship rights for all without regard to race. Overturning the Dred Scott decision, uh, the 14th Amendment extended birthright citizenship and equal protection of the laws to everyone. The 15th Amendment prohibited racial barriers to voting rights. Significantly, it said nothing about other kinds of barriers, including gender. As far-reaching and transformative as these amendments were, there were grave limits to radical reconstruction, something that former slaves and some Republicans recognized at the time. For many, if not most former slaves, freedom meant first and foremost land. They wanted the right to work for themselves, to own and work the lands that they had worked all their lives. At the end of the Civil War, the Freedmen's Bureau controlled over 850,000 acres of land, abandoned or confiscated during the war. And, and some free people, especially in places like South Carolina, had been allowed to work some of that land during the war. In October of 1865, when a group of freed people learned from Freedmen's Bureau agents that they would lose their claims to the, la to the land uh, that, that they were working, they pleaded their cause. Uh, they elected a spokesperson who appealed to the Freedmen's Bureau and this spokesperson said, you ask us to forgive the landowners of our island. The man who tied me to a tree and gave me 39 lashes and who stripped and flogged my mother and my sister and who will not let me stay in his empty hut except I will do his planning and be satisfied with his price and who combines with others to keep away land from me well knowing I would not have anything to do with him if I had land of my own. That man, I cannot forgive. Does it look as if he has forgiven me, seeing how he tries to keep me in a condition of helplessness? 
Now, some radical Republicans, especially Thaddeus Stevens, advocated the idea of mass confiscation and redistribution of land to former slaves, but they were in the distinct minority. Most Republicans believe that giving former slaves land would teach them the wrong lesson of freedom. Free handouts, supposedly, rather than the value of hard work to earn and purchase land. That is, in most Republicans' minds, former slaves needed to learn to work to buy the land that they had worked all their lives. And that's another great irony of Reconstruction. African Americans themselves strove for economic, social, and political independence, the kind of independence that Republicans told them that they ought to want, that is, land. And if they couldn't have land, just wages, family, school, community. But, re but Republicans in general could not envision policies to allow freed people to actually become economically independent. Instead, they concentrated on making them into long-term wage workers, a status no self-respecting, free labor-loving northern white man would have accepted at the time. Even in the realm of citizenship rights, it became very clear early on that U.S. citizenship would continue to be defined racially. Ever since 1790, <coughs> naturalized U.S. citizenship, that is citizenship for those who were born outside the United States, had been restricted to free white persons. And the 14th Amendment did nothing to change that racial requirement. Reconstruction, however, did raise anxious questions about what that, what that meant. What did it mean to be a free white person after emancipation? If blackness and slavery had been crucial to defining a free white person, that is a person capable of practicing self-government before Reconstruction, what would happen once African Americans became free with equal political rights, at least in a formal sense? It's as if those who considered themselves three white persons had the rug pulled out from them. What had defined them as free and white, that is enslaved and black, seemingly disappeared with Reconstruction. As a result, the campaign to restore, to reconstruct, to redeem the language that they used, to redeem white supremacy became a mission that defined and consolidated white during and after Reconstruction across the United States, not simply in the American South. And, and perhaps no debate captured the complexity of struggles over race, freedom, and citizenship more than the debates over naturalized citizenship. After reports of voter fraud during the 1868 elections, the House of Representatives decided to take up the issue in 1870 to tighten naturalization laws to criminalize the use of false testimony or impersonation in obtaining naturalized citizenship. And everyone knew once the debate began, that the law was targeting one group of voters in particular, foreign-born Irish Democrats of New York City. 
whose racial fitness for citizenship was being contested. And, and well into the 1870s, the degree to which the Irish were white, that they were capable of becoming responsible Republican citizenship uh, was in question. And, and this is a cartoon depicting the problems posed by African American voters in the South and Irish voters in the North. But the bill to reform the nation's naturalization laws generated vocal opposition on racial grounds. Lawmakers stood up to defend European immigration. As one New York representative put it, everything that was good in America, quote, belonged to our progenitors, the white people who earlier or later came from Europe, unquote. And, and they began promoting and celebrating the United States as the land of immigrants, a nation of immigrants, an image that the proposed law seemed to challenge. So the entire discussion began with efforts to regulate Irish naturalization. But in criticizing the proposed bill, lawmakers hailed the United States as the nation of immigrants, not from all over the world, but from Europe in particular, including the Irish. A Delaware senator argued that supporters of the measure were benighted because, he said, they loved darkness rather than light. By incorporating a large Negro population into the element of voters in the South, and by wanting to exclude light voters in the North. In the middle of all these debates, the old radical Republican from Massachusetts, Charles Sumner, stood up and added another amendment to the naturalization bill to remove the word white from the 1790 naturalization law. Sumner argued that he had been trying to pass such a measure for more than three years, but that every time he did so, uh, the measure would languish in committees. And he was determined, he said, to seize this golden opportunity. And his amendment to remove the word white <coughs> passed the Senate on July 2nd, 1870. And for a couple days, two days, uh, it actually appeared as if the United States Congress would remove racial barriers to naturalized citizenship to overturn the 1790 law for good. A fellow Republican argued, quote, I cannot understand the races of men, but only the human race. I do not know of any races of men, but only that one race. This is the Republican Party of the 19th century. <coughs> But then, West Coast Republicans from Oregon, Nevada, and California took the stage to kill Sumner's amendment. A senator from Nevada objected first, arguing that Sumner was proposing, quote, to extend naturalization not to those who desire to become citizens but to those who are being imported as slaves, unquote. Who was he talking about? The Chinese. These Republicans concentrated their attacks on the racial unfitness of the Chinese for American citizenship. And, and they had two arguments. The Chinese men were coolies. That is, a racial epithet applied to Asian workers to note that they were both naturally slavish and 
practically enslaved, and that all Chinese women were prostitutes out west. And both Republicans and Democrats argued and agreed that the Chinese were imported and enslaved by their employers. And in the process, they presented themselves as defenders of American freedom. In attacking Sumner, a senator from Oregon argued, quote, does the Declaration of Independence mean that Chinese coolies, that the Bushmen of South Africa, that the Hottentots, the Digger Indians, heathen, pagan, and cannibal shall have equal political rights under this government with citizens of the United States." Unquote. Like American Indians and African Americans, he argued, Mongolians were a peculiar and separate people who would and could never amalgamate with persons of European descent, according to this senator from Oregon. But Sumner had the votes, or it seemed. Um, Republicans still had the majority in Congress. And on the 4th of July, 1870, Sumner had high hopes to remake America, to get rid of the racial provision in its naturalization laws. Frederick Douglass had expressed that hope a year earlier in 1869, addressing the growing anti-Chinese movement, especially out west. He said, quote, I want a home here, not only for the Negro, the mulatto, and the Latin races, but I want the Asiatic to find a home here in the United States and feel at home here not both for his sake and for ours. Right wrongs no man. If respect is had to majorities, the fact that only one-fifth of the population of the globe is white, the other four-fifths are colored, ought to have some measure and influence in disposing of this and similar questions." Unquote. But most Republicans did not agree. Sumner's amendment went down in overwhelming defeat on, on a revote on July 4th, 1870. And that law would not be overturned completely until 1952. <coughs> now at that point, another Republican suggested adding the clause, aliens of African nativity and to persons of African descent to the naturalization law on, on free white persons. And that amendment passed by one single vote. When a shocked radical Republican asked how his colleagues could extend naturalization rights to Africans and not to the Chinese, his opponents had a simple answer. And that answer was, a few black people might come from the Caribbean, but Africans, he said, would not, and more importantly, could not come, uh, th they said, uh, th the pe people that supported the clause. It was physically impossible, they said, since there were no direct ship routes between Africa and America at the time. What happened in Congress in the summer of 1870 had a significant impact on shaping notions of race, freedom, and citizenship during Reconstruction. First, the Chinese were characterized as racially unfit for U.S. citizenship. Like African Americans before the Civil War, they were represented to embody Slave, slavish qualities antithetical to American Republican citizenship. 
Not only would racial barriers to citizenship remain, those who supported such racial restrictions now presented themselves as anti-slavery, as standing up for the cause of freedom. Such framings of freedom reproduced antebellum racial logics that had equated whiteness with freedom and blackness with slavery. Second, the inclusion of Africans rested not on hopes of uh, racial equality, but on visions of continued inequality. And that amendment on Africans passed by one single vote. Third, by the end of the debate, the original targets of the bill, Irish immigrants who were accused of corrupting, corrupting the workings of the American Republic, had come to represent the exemplars of the nation, a white nation of immigrants. Race resolved the contradiction between the image of the nation of immigrants and the passage of restrictions on naturalization and eventually immigration. This is how one senator put it, in every European country on the face of the earth, in every kingdom and empire and principality in Europe, there are people who will make good American citizens because they are attached to Republican institutions and who have aspirations for Republican freedom. The Chinese and other Asians were deemed unfit for Republican citizenship. And these congressional debates of 1870 uh, portended the future as racial violence engulfed the South, especially surrounding elections and the American West in the form of wars with American Indians and vigilante attacks on the Chinese. And the federal government uh, the federal government's commitment to radical reconstruction, to enforcing reconstruction, uh, dissipated very quickly. Really, radical reconstruction was over before it really began, as white Democrats, sometimes calling themselves conservatives, uh, regained control of the South, state by state, beginning in 1869. With the Supreme Court gutting the heart of the 14th and 15th Amendments in a series of decisions in the 1870s, local and state governments and paramilitary organizations like the Ku Klux Klan work hand in hand to kill the idea and the practice of what was the closest thing to democracy in U.S. history up to that point. The disputed elections of, uh, <coughs> disputed election of Rutherford B. Hayes to the White House in 1876, amid great racial violence, symbolically ended Reconstruction. By early 1877, when a compromise between Democrats and Republicans appeared close to put Hayes in the White House, a Republican from Kansas captured Hayes' priorities. He said, quote, I think the policy of the new administration will be to conciliate the white men of the South, carpet ba carpetbaggers to the rear, and niggers take care of yourselves, unquote. As Hayes ordered federal troops to abide by white Democrats' claims to power in state governments across the South, he did not hesitate to dispatch the U.S. military for other causes. In the summer of 1877, Hayes dispatched some federal troops out of the South to suppress a nationwide strike of railroad and other workers. And in the same months, Hayes also ordered federal troops to wage war against the Nez Perce right here in the Pacific Northwest. 
part of a wider effort to secure control over the American West. These turn of events, that is, the U.S. states retreat from reconstruction and black political rights, the subjection of peoples to racial violence, and the U.S. states' persistent and insistent claims to stand for freedom had far-reaching consequences in the decades following the Civil War. By the late 1870s, as David Blight has argued, emancipation was being erased from memories of the Civil War. As calls for a national reconciliation justified and reinforced Republicans' growing rejection of radical reconstruction. Emancipation was being buried with national racial reconciliation. On Memorial Day in 1877, <clears throat> two months after Hayes' Hayes's inauguration, white Northerners and Southerners came together to honor the more than 600,000 people who had died during the Civil War. And the themes of the day were national forgetting and national forgiveness, and the equal valor of Union and Confederate forces. So the New York Herald declared, quote, all the issues on which the war of the rebellion was fought seem dead. American eyes have a characteristic tendency to look forward and let the past be, be with itself, unquote. And appeals for national unity came from the North and the South. A Union veteran said, quote, over the grave of buried bygones, rejoice. Rejoice that now as soldiers and citizens, we know no North, no South, no East, no West, only one country and one flag. In the process, Reconstruction, not slavery, Reconstruction came to be the marker of tyranny and injustice for the white South. Uh, rejoicing in calls for national reunification, a Confederate veteran recall, recalled Reconstruction as, quote, that dismal period massacres of the helpless, violations of the ballot, usurpations of force on the popular will, and the independence of the states." Unquote. Following the lead of white Democrats in the South, many Republicans likewise turned to race to explain the failure of Reconstruction. They tended not to blame themselves, their policies, or even racial violence for the failure of Reconstruction. It was not due to the lack of federal protection or resources, in their view. Instead, Republicans and Democrats, whites in the North, whites in the South, turn to race, blaming African Americans for the failure of Reconstruction. African Americans were supposedly not ready to govern they were not ready to participate as equal citizens. By 1877, the outgoing president, Ulysses S. Grant, commented that the 15th Amendment had been a mistake and that, quote, it had done the Negro no good, unquote. A northern newspaper praised and embraced the end of Reconstruction, arguing Quote, the Negro will disappear from the field of national politics. Henceforth, the nation as a nation will have nothing more to do with him, unquote. And that would become the standard interpretation of Reconstruction for almost a century, captured iconically in the film The Birth of a Nation in 1915, in which the Ku Klux Klan emerges heroically to save democracy for the South 
and for the nation. The turn of events uh, <clears throat> astounded and alarmed those who had fought for emancipation. In 1875, Frederick Douglass voiced those concerns by asking, if war among the whites brought peace and liberty to the blacks, what will peace among the whites bring? By the time William McKinley was elected president in 1896, such questions see had seemingly been resolved. As McKinley, who was the last veteran of the Civil War to be elected president, led the United States to war with Spain in 1898, he recognized that war's power to unite whites, North and South. The Spanish-American War, he said, served as a, quote, magic healing which has closed ancient wounds and effaced their scars, unquote. If race and war allowed national reunification, they did so through, not in spite of, but through the forgetting of emancipation's centrality to the Civil War and through ongoing racial violence mobilized in the name of liberation and freedom. Memories of the Civil War as a noble cause both for the Confederates and for the Union forces uh, without a reckoning with slavery and emancipation helped to justify wars of the present. The Civil War came to be understood as a war over state rights not over slavery. And as the United States prepared to purchase and occupy the Philippines after the Spanish-American War, which would lead to the bloody U.S.-Philippine War, McKinley announced that his nation came, quote, not as invaders, but as friends, and would strive to win the confidence respect and affection of the inhabitants of the Philippines by assuring them in every possible way that full measure of individual rights and liberties, which is the heritage of free peoples." Unquote. But the race lay at the heart of this and future American wars, a key to framing wars of imperial aggression and occupation as wars for liberation and to killing fellow human beings on a massive scale with impunity. Theodore Roosevelt, McKinley's vice president and successor said, quote, we have no more right to leave the Filipinos to butcher one another and sink slowly back into savagery than we would have the right in an excess of sentimentality to declare the Sioux and the Apaches free to expel all white settlers from the lands they once held." Unquote. And American military forces applied a litany of racial epithets to Filipinos, including the N-word. The meanings of the U.S.-Philippine War at the dawn of the 20th century unnerved especially black soldiers in the Philippines. An African-American sergeant wrote from the Philippines, quote, I feel sorry for these people and all that have come under the control of the United States. The first thing in the morning is the nigger and the last thing at night is the nigger, unquote. Such critical observations came to be silenced by a chorus of white supremacy, freedom, and civilization. Three decades after the Civil War, the sons of Union and Confederate veterans traveled across the Pacific to wage war together in the words of Theodore Roosevelt, quote, for the greatness of the nation for the greatness of 
the race. Eliding emancipation from their parents' war allowed them to fight a race war for the so-called liberation of the Philippines from savagery. I don't want to end my lecture on such a depressing note. Um, so let's take a 10 minute break and I will wrap up by suggesting how we might interpret and pursue uh, struggles for freedom. And if you have questions for any of uh, the speakers in the series, please uh, write them down and hand them to uh, Matt who will hold a box in the front. When I feel politically depressed, which is often, <coughs> and intellectually lost, I turn to W.E.B. Du Bois. The black scholar activist who wrote Black Reconstruction in America in 1935, in my estimation, the best book the American historical public, uh, profession has ever produced. In Black Reconstruction, Du Bois was careful to stress the global roots of race and labor, to tie both firmly to colonialism the world over. Although almost the entire volume, and it's very long, 721 pages, I believe, um, <clears throat> almost the entire book focused on black and whites in the South, but he stressed the stakes of slavery and emancipation were much deeper and wider. Summing up what we've been talking about over the last four weeks, Du Bois argued that slavery was, quote, the foundation stone not only of the southern social structure, but of northern manufacture and commerce, of the English factory system, of European commerce, of buying and selling on a worldwide scale. New cities were built on the result of black labor. In stating the expansiveness, expansiveness of his vision, Du Bois argued that he wanted to get at the roots of what he called the modern labor problem, the real modern labor problem. It was not an American problem, though America was surely implicated. It was a global problem that tied together, as he put it, that dark, and vast sea of human labor in China and in India, the South Seas, and all Africa, in the West Indies and Central America, and in the United States, that great majority of mankind. And, and in that volume, Black Reconstruction, Du Bois made it very clear that emancipation was not something of the past something that was effected in 1863, but something to struggle for now, in the present and into the future. In my favorite line from that book, he wrote, the emancipation of man is the emancipation of labor. And the emancipation of labor is the freeing of that basic majority of workers who are yellow, brown, and black. Framing emancipation as such, Du Bois recognized black soldiers as playing a critical role in the project of, of abolition. But he noted the distinctions and indeed the contradictions between national citizenship and freedom. He stated, the Negro might plead his cause with the tongue of Frederick Douglass, and the nation listened almost unmoved. He might labor for the nation's wealth, and the nation took the result without thanks, and handed him as near nothing in return as would keep him alive. But when he rose and fought and killed 
the whole nation with one vote proclaimed him a man and a brother. Nothing else made emancipation possible in the United States. Nothing else made Negro citizenship conceivable but the record of the Negro soldier as a fighter. And for, for Du Bois, that was tragic. Uh, because if violence translated into citizenship rights, violence quickly took them away. In Du Bois' interpretation of slavery and freedom, emancipation and the struggle for freedom and democracy had to continue. And for him, that struggle defined the legacy of the Civil War and Reconstruction. Within black struggles for freedom, he wrote, lived, quote, the consciousness of a great and just cause, fighting the battle of all the oppressed and despised humanity of every race and color against the massed hirelings of religion, science, education, law, and brute force. To put it another way, Du Bois was arguing that the story of the struggle for freedom did not begin or end in 1863. It lived on. Freedom could not be limited to a legal status or a set, of a, a set of rights conferred or denied by the state. It was something bigger. It had to be. For Du Bois, it was the collective struggle for justice and democracy that ought to define freedom. We've been gathering here over the last month to commemorate the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. These historical commemorations are significant because they allow us to reflect critically on the past. In fact, to reinterpret the past. They should not be moments of uh, romantic celebration. Returning to Du Bois, he was born during Radical Reconstruction in 1868. He lived a very long life, and he died in Africa on August 27th, 1963, at 11.40 p.m. Many Americans heard of his death the next day at the March on Washington on August 28, 1963. As you no doubt notice, there were a lot of commemorations of the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech this past summer, where he spoke of a dream, quote, deeply rooted in the American dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. When I saw Jack O'Dell this last summer, and Jack O'Dell is a longtime intellectual and organizer of the Black Freedom Movement who had worked with King, very closely with King for a time, uh, Jack O'Dell stressed that we cannot use that moment, the 50th anniversary of that march, to celebrate King's remarkable speech. King would not have wanted that, Odell said urgently. We needed to use that moment to reflect on where King would end up. Because the I Have a Dream speech marked only a step in King's own political evolution and transformation. On April 4th, 1967, Martin Luther King broke his public silence on the Vietnam War and offered a much deeper critique of the state of the world, very much in line with W.E.B. Du Bois. Identifying the U.S. government as the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, 
and speaking as, as he said, a citizen of the world. King recalled a larger sense of history, as he put it, beyond the prophesying of smooth patriotism. He stated, I speak for those whose land is being laid to waste, whose homes are being destroyed, whose culture is being subverted. I speak for the poor of America who are paying the double price of smashed hopes at home and death and corruption in Vietnam. These are words that speak so vividly, so urgently to our current political moment. The struggle for freedom must continue. And as we reflect critically on the history of slavery and freedom in the making of America, I hope our four lectures have helped open our eyes to the great intellectual and political stakes of that topic. It's a deep, rich, complex history that can depress, frustrate, and inspire. Rather than framing slavery simply as a nation's original sin that could be absolved and resolved neatly and finally through promises supposedly embedded in the Constitution, we must approach the topic of slavery and freedom expansively and critically. And it's only then, I believe, that we can begin to imagine and pursue freedom expansively and critically in our own time. Thank you. Boy, I went much longer than I expected, so sorry about that. Um, but I'm happy to take maybe three questions, and then I'll ask the other speakers to come up, and we'll uh, respond to all of your questions. But if there are no questions, we're, I can invite everybody up, since we only have about 20 minutes left anyway. Oh, yeah. so we're we're have a bit time. Okay. <coughs> all right. Professor Moon, um, it's not my last name. Um, uh, what about resistance to reconstruction, post-reconstruction, uh, white racial violence? Yeah, what about it? Um, <laughs> it was bad. Um, yeah, no, th there was great resistance. Um, you know, the Ku Klux Klan emerged right after the Civil War. Um, down in Louisiana, the state that I know best, they had uh, paramilitary organizations like the Knights of White Camellia, the White League. Um, and, you know, when we think about the Ku Klux Klan, we need to be careful uh, to remember that the members were the most respected members of the community, right? And so it crossed class boundaries and, and these uh, acts of vigilante attacks on both Republicans and especially uh, African Americans um, really galvanized and mobilized and organized whites across the South, right? And so, yeah, no, the resistance to Reconstruction was fierce, it was violent, and it helped undo that was the primary force behind the end of Reconstruction. Right. Does that answer your question, whoever wrote that? No? No, it's okay. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay, what, so what about resistance against? Uh, by African Americans, by the federal government, or both? Well, yeah, I mean, there's a great tradition of self-defense uh, 
not only in the South, but especially in the South, because, you know, they had to defend themselves. Um, and, and so there were pockets of the South where there was a, a black majority, for example, where there were African Americans in office beyond Reconstruction, or what we formally uh, periodize as Reconstruction, right? So into the 1890s and into the 20th century. So yeah, there was resistance to white supremacy. Yeah, most definitely, uh, on multiple fronts, not only through armed self-defense, but you know, politically, intellectually, ideologically. And, and then for a time, uh, the federal government also passed laws. Uh, they passed a law called the Enforcement Act, the Ku Klux Klan Act, uh, to try to stifle, to try to suppress uh, the level of violence engulfing the South. But pretty much the enforcement powers um, were limited to begin, to begin with, but they were pretty much gone by the middle of the 1870s. Answer a question? All right, define free labor. That's not a question, that's an imperative. Um, <laughs> no, you define free labor. Um, was it a property rights issue or the ability to freely move from job to job? Well, as I said, free labor for Republicans meant one thing, right, which was the right to work to become an independent self producer, right? So that's their idea of free labor. Um, but I think that what the question is asking is define freedom, perhaps. And I don't know, I mean, freedom is a really tough subject to define, right? Because historically, and I think the first three lectures talked at length about this, freedom has been defined against and through slavery, right? Um, and so, I mean, the closest, I think, is what Du Bois had, but even there, it doesn't really tell you how that freeing of that basic majority of workers would come about, right? And so what I was suggesting at the very end is that it's really up to us to define what freedom is and ought to be, right? And, and for Du Bois, it definitely is about labor, right? Um, but not in labor in the terms that the Freedmen's Bureau or the Republican officials thought about black labor, right? It was something much bigger than that, right? Do you guys want to come up? Or the rest of these are so long. Um, all right. I'll do one more, okay? I've noticed in the Q&A sessions of this series that audience members use words like corrupt, poison, and hypocrisy to describe slavery in the United States. Yet all of you have pointed out how constitutive slavery is to our uh, understanding of self, nation, and economic being. My question, why do we continue to desire to see slavery as an aberration rather than making an integral? Man, <laughs> this person understood what I was talking about. Um, yeah, no, that's what I was trying to get at with Obama's quote. Again, I'm not trying to attack Obama the person or the Obama, the person that delivered that speech, but by casting slavery as a sin, okay, an original sin, um, it implies that it can be absolved somehow, right? Over time, perhaps. And, and I think the person that wrote this question has it right, which is it was not an aberration, right? It was actually, the institution that defined the United States, right? And if we approach it that way, trying to cast slavery as an aberration or a sin becomes silly, right? And I think that is exactly how we need to approach it, right? So in 1776, when um, the United States became a republic, you know, 20% of the population was enslaved, 20% of what was the United States. So we're not talking about a marginal institution in any sense, right? Demographically, economically, politically, socially. And so I think, yeah, we need to reckon with the centrality 
of slave, slavery in the making of America. Right? Um, how about now if I invite the other three speakers to join me. <laughs> Thank you. So Sandra Joshua, Stephanie Smallwood, Stephanie Camp. Regarding slave societies as different from societies with slaves, and then the, here are the questions. What are some of the ways that our society is a slave society, either inheriting early and mid-American slavery or new forms? Well, we are still a society with slaves, right? There, you can read on any website, the w Department of State website, the UN website, you can listen to NPR a couple of days ago, that there are slaves, people enslaved in our society, and there is a large trafficking of people. Uh, are we a slave society in the sense that, in the three senses that all of us have talked about, that slaves are central to the production of wealth, that there are a certain percentage of slaves. I, I think I, we'd have to say that, that we are not a slave society. I, I think the, the, the question is different. The ways in which we inherit and we still live out um, what slavery has meant in the making of America, that, that is, uh, it seems to me, uh, another question, which I, I'm going to leave to my colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> the second question is, what does, it, what does it look like to undo and unbecome a slave society? Um, I think this is exactly what Professor Jung addressed and W.E. Du Bois uh, addressed, that we have to rethink the past, reinterpret the past, and think about what that, what slavery freedom m means in the present. I know that's kind of general, but um, in some societies in Rome, it would have been impossible to, to unthink a slave society. It was so thoroughly embedded in the, the, um, in the social order, which is what makes emancipation, I think, as Professor Jung has made so clear, which makes emancipation this major and in fact, uh, in world history, an unusual moment. My turn? Your turn. Um, I think I'm actually gonna, before I read, is my mic on? Yeah, okay. Before I read these questions, I'm also gonna just comment on, on one of those questions. I mean, I think the question about, you know, are we a slave society or a society with slaves today also gets to the question of you know, what are the ways and the places in which that distinction is useful? I think the societies with slaves, slave society distinction is very useful for understanding slavery in its long history when slavery was legal. And we haven't talked much, but there's a lot that we didn't get to cover in this series. We didn't talk much about the rise of anti-slavery ideology um, across, um, you know, the second half of the 18th century and then into the 19th century. But the question I think that, that we can kind of spin out of this, and particularly out of Professor Jung's lecture this evening, is you know, what happens to slavery in the context of, of the sweep of abolition movements um, and, and actual abolition events across the 19th century? And I think we have to ask ourselves, you know, does slavery go away when it becomes illegal? And I think um, the thing that we're confronting today when you know, all of us studied slavery as something that by definition was past. When I was in graduate school, I mean, the three of us, are the, we were all in grad school at the same time. Y you couldn't take a course on contemporary slavery when we were in graduate school 20 years ago. I teach a course on contemporary human trafficking today. We can't turn on CNN or NPR or open a newspaper today without confronting the fact that there are 27 million, that's the current estimate, people who are slaves today. And I think understanding how we get from what we've covered in this lecture series to these statistics that we're seeing today is a question about, well, where did slavery go? And I think the answer is it never went away. We buried it. We called it by another name. We displaced it. That's why I think the points that Professor Jung made um, 
you know, about the need to think of this expansively is so important um, because slavery continued. It continued in Asia, it continued in Africa, it continued with the British Empire across the 19th century. And, you know, our current global economy is bringing it, it's, it's on our radar now in the U.S. because it's bringing it into the U.S. and we can't ignore it anymore. Um, some of the questions I have here, one is how did gradual emancipation laws uh, such as were passed in places like New York in the late 18th and early 19th century work out for the enslaved? Did people actually achieve their freedom or were they sold south? That's a great question um, and it speaks to the fact that in the aftermath of the American Revolution, the northern states did abolish slavery. By the end of the first decade of the 19th century, all of the northern states had formally abolished slavery. But the question in, uh, is quite right in that many of these were gradual emancipation um, laws that meant that the, that the actual freedom itself was going to be several decades in the making for blacks in the North. Um, many blacks did achieve the legal status of being free, but they did so in the context of what, as Professor Jung pointed out, had become you know, this experiment in Republican government that was the early United States that had enshrined slavery in its founding documents. Right? That fugitive slave provision meant that northern states, everyone in northern states, was legally obligated to protect southerns, southerners' investments in slave property. And so that meant that black freedom was fragile. It's also true that the northern states, by the middle of the 18th century, so several decades before the revolution, had already become states uh, or colonies uh, that were very hostile to black freedom, colonies that had passed laws that put all kinds of restrictions on black freedom. One historian has called it racism without slavery because the slaves were a very small percentage of the population in the northern colonies, but there was a growing trend toward a kind of intolerance um, for African Americans. And so black freedom uh, across U.S. history is something that has been fragile and something that's been, um, that, that's been under attack. Uh, so that, that would be my answer to that question. And then I have a question here, um, two questions here, and I'm going to basically condense them into one, about reparations. Many of you may have noticed um, in the last two weeks or so, it's actually been in the press, that uh, 14 Caribbean island nations have joined together and are planning to bring um, a, a court case uh, against Britain, France, and the Netherlands demanding reparations. And the question is, one, what chance do they have of succeeding? Two, what organizations would receive the payments? Three, would acceptance by these nations set a precedent for the US to do the same thing? Um, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know the answer to what's going to happen with this, but I think it's really interesting and important that we be willing to talk about reparations, because the question of reparations is a question about accounting, quite literally, not just figuratively, but accounting for what is an enormous and arguably incalculable human cost um, of modern Western freedom. I mean, when you consider that three quarters of the 14 million or so immigrants who crossed the Atlantic to American colonies before 1820 were African slaves. You know, it, it, there's, there's, no, there, there's no escaping the fact that black slavery was part of the startup cost of the Americas. So we can't begin to answer the nitty gritty questions of like, well, how would you do reparations until we're willing to have an honest conversation, and this comes back to the beautiful conclusion that, that my colleague gave just a few minutes ago. We've got to be willing to talk about this. And the interesting thing is that one of the first answers that comes up is, well, how would we ever figure out what the price would be? You know, how would we come up with the number? Well, here's the interesting thing. In 1825, in exchange for diplomatic recognition 
the French government demanded that Haiti, the second independent republic in the Americas, pay a price. They demanded that they pay 90 million francs in indemnity to compensate for the property loss that French citizens suffered as a result of the French Revolution. When the British abolished slavery throughout the British Empire in 1834, they paid millions of pounds in compensation for the loss of property that ensued. No one ever questioned, no one ever had the inability to put a number on the loss of property when slave trading, slavery, right? No one, no one had a problem with that. But when we ask the reverse question, all of a sudden we throw up our hands and say, oh, we can't come up with a number. So one way that people have approached this is to say, well, what if we start with those numbers and reverse them? <laughs> Aristide and, o and O3 demanded that the French repay. And the thing about that indemnity is that the Haitian government, a fledgling young country that needed to be recognized in order to, to, to exist, to be viable, they had to borrow money from French banks in order to pay the so-called debt. That was the beginning of a cycle of debt that lasts to this day. So Aristide said in 03, how about you pay that money back to us at current value, which was you know, billions of dollars. Oh, well, you know, we couldn't do that. I mean, we can, we can put a number. We can have a conversation and say that labor was real, that there was real blood and sweat that was extinguished, that was consumed, that was used up and not accounted for. So that's my feeling and my answer to the question of reparations. Is we, we're not, we, we can't begin to start to really figure out how you would do it until we have an honest conversation about the fact that this is something that has to be explored. Uh, Stephanie. <clears throat> Sorry. Actually, I think I'm okay. up. Um, well, one question I got was about uh, land reform. Uh, in order for this argument to be valid, though, you need to demonstrate that the federal union government had the power to implement land reforms uh, Basically, it's asking, you know, the federal government really ha did not have the authority at the time in the 1860s to confiscate these lands and redistribute them. Um, well, you know, state power increased dramatically uh, through and especially after the Civil War. Um, so it's a, it's a state that's very much in formation, and to argue that land reform was not within the horizon of possibilities in 1865, for example, or, eight, or 1866, is, is wrong, right? It definitely was within the horizon of possibilities for former slaves. They were quite insistent, many of them, that they wanted the land, right? That was their primary uh, demand um, after the Civil War. So, I think it could have been possible had the political will been there, but the, the very definition of free labor, I think, uh, dismissed and suppressed that possibility, right? Um, and, and so the Freedmen's Bureau had, what, 850,000 acres, not that much land. If you think about four million uh, enslaved peoples becoming um, free in 1865, but you know, it was a good start. They didn't have to give that land back to former Confederates, right? At least keep it and distribute it to former slaves, right? Um, but I think the way many union officials and Republicans approached the question was, are we gonna have Haiti? Or are we going to have the British West Indies? And they wanted the British West Indies, right? They wanted it gradual. They wanted 
uh, former slaves to go back on the plantations. They wanted the state to compel workers to work, right? not to become landowners. Do you have any other questions you want to get to? I have one more. <coughs> okay. Um, which I think we should open up to everyone. All right. Um, I was wondering if you could discuss the relationship between emancipation and continued forms of unfreedom or bondage through the 13th Amendment's loophole, which allowed for slavery in the case of crime. To what extent do you see forms of incarceration or convict labor as a continuation of slavery? <laughs> see, I just asked the question. <laughs> And moments like this, I remind people that I'm really an early modernist, and that <laughs> this is the 19th an century Asian historian. historian. I really do Asian American <laughs> history. <laughs> um, you know, I think that's a really interesting a really question. Interesting I forget question. the exact figure, but I think there are more African Americans in prison today than the number of African Americans enslaved in 1865, right, or 1861. So it's uh, it's uh, it's a development that I think we need to contend with. I think it's a very pointed question, um, and I think it's right on. I think these are the kinds of questions that we need to grapple with, right? Uh, rather than simply celebrating emancipation, right, the abolition of slavery, and we should point out that the United States was the third to the last in the Americas, right? Third to the last to abolish slavery. Um, and so I think there are deep legacies, and I think the industrial uh, incarceration prison complex is definitely one of the legacies of both slavery and what happens after slavery, right? Um, because some of the laws that I talk about, you know, these vagrants, vagrancy codes and so forth, I mean, those are pretty much... Uh, what we're talking about in terms of the penal codes that came about immediately after slavery that would live on, right, in many different incarnations. Thank you very much. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all for coming.